Hi everyone and welcome to Biology Professor. Today we're going to be talking about the structure of the chloroplast. I just did a video uh, recently on the structure of mitochondria, so make sure you also check that one out. And if you're interested in more biology study videos, don't forget to subscribe and hit that bell icon to get notifications on new videos. So let's go ahead and get started. Right here on the board, I have drawn a, a basic diagram of a chloroplast. So before we kind of delve into that, what exactly is a chloroplast? Well, a chloroplast is an organelle. It's found in plants or algae. Specifically, the, you know, these chloroplasts are found in uh, organisms that conduct photosynthesis. So remember that photosynthesis, it's a metabolic process. This is where light energy is converted into chemical bonds so that carbon dioxide is fixed to make organic molecules like glucose. There are um, approximately, um, somewhere on the order of 30 to 40 chloroplasts per mesophyll cell in leaves. Obviously there's gonna be variation between different kinds of species. Um, and between plants and, and algae. So now let's take a look at the structure of these chloroplasts. I'm going to basically start right here with the outer membrane, it's labeled A, and we will work our way around these labels until we get to the final one, K, the starch granule. So let's start by talking about that outer membrane. You'll see there are two membranes. There's an outer membrane, an inner membrane, there's an intermembrane space between them, and then everything else is inside that inner membrane. So the outer membrane, this is particularly porous, like a lot of stuff can get through that outer membrane, and it is evidence for something called endosymbiosis. Now I have another video on endosymbiosis or the endosymbiotic theory um, where we learn about the different types of evidence, including the outer membrane, also the uh, 70S ribosomes we'll talk about in a little bit. Um, evidence for basically the evolution of mitochondria and chloroplasts from endosymbiotic events. So if you're interested, definitely check that video out. Now, inside the outer membrane, there is the intermembrane space. It's just kind of this small, like, fluid-filled compartment, and it is mostly empty. Like, there's, there's fluid, but otherwise it's, it's pretty empty. And then inside that, we've got the inner membrane. The inner membrane regulates passage in and out a lot more. So a movement of things from outside the chloroplast, remember outside the chloroplast is gonna be the cytoplasm of the cell. Um, and then inside the chloroplast, this right here, the inside kind of compartment is um, like a, a fluid filled um, area known as the stroma. So the inner membrane does a much um, better job at regulating passage you know, in and out of these compartments than the outer membrane does. So the inner membrane, um, in addition to regulating that passage in and out, is also an, a location for synthesis of important things, particularly certain lipids and carotenoids. You may have heard of carotenoids. These are basically like accessory pigments that are there to um, absorb kind of excess wavelengths of light during photosynthesis to basically protect the, the leaf tissue. Next we'll talk about the stroma. Remember the stroma is like the fluid filled compartment inside the inner membrane where all this other stuff is located. It also has the correct enzymes and a suitable pH for the Calvin cycle. Now, if you've studied photosynthesis really in any kind of detail, you know what the Calvin cycle is. It's also known as the light independent reactions or sometimes called the dark cycle. And this is where carbon dioxide is fixed into an organic form um, that eventually supports like the synthesis of um, glucose and other organic uh, molecules. So, all, so that portion of photosynthesis, the Calvin cycle happens in the stroma. And again, I think I've said this, the stroma is quite aqueous or fluid filled. It can have kind of a gelatinous type consistency because there is so much kind of dissolved in it, you know, all this stuff. 
Next, we'll talk about the thylakoids. So singular for that is thylakoid, plural thylakoids. You just add that S. This basically, um, each one of these things that I've drawn in green is a thylakoid. Like that's a thylakoid, 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 that's a thylakoid. Even the longer ones, the lamellae that we'll talk about later are sometimes called thylakoids. So in green, we've got our thylakoids. And these are basically these um, like fluid-filled sacs, and they contain the electron transport chains, ATP synthases, and chlorophyll for the light reactions of photosynthesis. And specifically, this is in their, um, their membranes, okay? So the membranes of the thylakoids hold all of these necessary components to drive the light reactions. Sometimes these are also called the light-dependent reactions. They are a part of um, photosynthesis that basically precedes the Calvin cycle. So again, if you study photosynthesis, I think you, you kind of already know how to distinguish the Calvin cycle and light reactions. <clears throat> But the inside space, um, like inside these thylakoids, the inside space is called the lumen. And we often talk about the lumen, particularly when we're talking about the electron transport chains and the ATP synthases, because it is the, the basically the buildup of hydrogen ions on one side of the thylakoid membrane that creates a gradient that powers the ATP synthases. So if you're studying uh, the light reactions, you're often talking about the lumen and you know what's happening in the lumen versus the stroma. Okay, now let's talk about what a stack of thylakoids is called. A stack of thylakoids, like this one right here, is called a granum. <clears throat> so we have a granum here, another granum, another granum, another granum, another granum. Uh, and so these are the stacks of thylakoids. The plural form is grana. <clears throat> Excuse me. So if you're talking about just one, it's a grana ending in U-M. If you're talking about multiple of these, they're called grana. So you know the, the, um, each chloroplast has multiple grana that are these stacks of thylakoids. Why do these things exist? They are here to increase the surface area to volume ratio. Um, so basically the thylakoids, they get organized into these grana and all of these thylakoids, each thylakoid has all of these different um, membranes and this really increases the surface area to volume ratio because remember it's in these membranes that you have all of these important components embedded. And the more membrane you have, the more um, you know, efficient and effective these light reactions are. If you want to learn more about surface area to volume ratio, I also have a video on that topic that goes into a lot more detail. So check that out. Next, we'll talk about the lamellae. So singular is lamella. Ooh, little um, bump in the house there. Uh, singular is lamella, plural is lamellae, you just add that E at the end. And this is a, a specialized term for these thylakoids that you see that are quite um, long and will kind of connect like one granum to another granum. So like this one right here is kind of connecting this granum to this granum. So the lamellae are a way to connect grana and kind of make... Um, just like a nice interconnected system here. And so the lamellae, they connect the grana. Sometimes these will be called stromal thylakoids um, as opposed to like granal thylakoids. So you might hear, you might hear sort of this being called a thylakoid, but this being called a lamella, or you might be, be hearing this right here called a granal thylakoid, and this being called a stromal thylakoid. So they just have some different terms occasionally. Now let's talk about H over here. This is drawn in pink. You can see I've drawn um, two of these in this particular uh, like diagram of a chloroplast. This is the chloroplast DNA, sometimes called CP DNA. And so CP DNA, that's the abbreviation, you've got typically dozens 
or even hundreds of these per chloroplast. I've drawn two. So you have to imagine dozens or hundreds of those packed in here. So very important. Um, and each of these is going to have, you know, somewhere on the order of 100 to 200 genes. That's going to depend on the, um, on the particular species. So 100 to 200 genes on dozens to hundreds of copies per chloroplast. Every uh, copy is going to be identical. Uh, what else was I going to say? There's also, so these 100 to 200 genes, they do provide the information for a lot of what happens in the chloroplast, but there are also things in the chloroplast that are the, the products um, or, or controlled by genes in the nuclear DNA. So the nuclear DNA still contributes to some of these processes. Um, then, you know, going kind of next on our diagram, we're going to this one, ribosomes. I've drawn several little ribosomes in red. These are 70S ribosomes. We say 70S, this is like a sedimentation unit or a Stenberg unit. This is to distinguish the ribosomes that are in mitochondria and chloroplasts, which are 70S ribosomes, from eukaryotic ribosomes that are in plant and animal and fungal and protozoan uh, cytoplasms, basically, which are 80S. Uh, and this right here, the fact that these are different, that these are more similar to ribosomes from prokaryotes, so bacteria, um, is another big piece of evidence for endosymbiosis. So again, if you're interested in learning more about that, check out my video on uh, the endosymbiotic theory. But these ribosomes, their main function is to translate the proteins that are encoded by the chloroplast DNA. So chloroplast DNA will be transcribed, there will be some, some RNA, that will go to the ribosome and be translated to make proteins that are important in the various functions that are being carried out um, in this photosynthetic process uh, in the um, chloroplast. Next, we've got plastoglobuli. Now, singular is plastoglobulus. Plural, plastoglobuli. I've drawn them here in blue. Um, I have put kind of some um, horizontal lines just to distinguish the blue and the purple circles, um, particularly for people who um, may not be able to see those colors um, very distinguishably. But so I, I've just drawn some like lines through these, but that's just to help you visually separate them, not to indicate anything particular about their appearance. Because these plastoglobuli, they're really just spherical bubbles of lipids and proteins, okay? Spherical bubbles containing lipids and proteins involved in synthesis and breakdown of various things that are important to chloroplast function, think vitamin E, carotenoids, chlorophylls, etc. And they're also important in mediating the stress response. So when a cell is under stress, um, chloroplasts can change, you know, how they're functioning to respond to that stress and plastoglobuli you know, have basically the components that allow them to make those, those different responses. Finally, we're going to do the, the last one. We've made it to the end, starch granules. The, the um, couple of things you should remember about starch granules, those are indicated just as kind of purple um, spheres or, or ovals in my diagram. These do not have a membrane. So there's no membrane and they grow throughout uh, the, the day and then they're consumed at night. So during the day they're getting bigger, 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 and at night they're going to get smaller. Why is this? Well, starch granules. Remember the point of photosynthesis is to use that light energy, convert it into chemical energy, basically to, to the bonds that are uh, holding all of that carbon, you know, fixed from the carbon dioxide into organic molecules like glucose, those are stored kind of temporarily as starch. And so these starch granules contain the products of the photosynthesis. The photosynthesis that's happening during the day when there's light available to power those light reactions um, allows the, the glucose and, you know, to be made, glucose and other sugars, and for it to be stored in the form of starch. 
And so the starch granules, as the glucose is being made and converted into a starch form, they're getting bigger, bigger, bigger. And then at night, they're being consumed. They're being used. Um, so they're, they're being consumed each night via the process of respiration, cell respiration, aerobic respiration, um, different terms for that process. Uh, so they're being consumed via respiration. This is to make ATP for you know not not just the not just the chloroplast, right? But for the whole for the whole organism, for the whole cell. Um, so they can either be consumed via respiration if they're needed, like in that location, or they can actually be exported to the phloem and shared with the rest of the with the rest of the organism, with the rest of the plant. Uh, and these things can get so big during the day that they can even be up to 15% of the entire chloroplast volume. So you can see these starch granules. I mean, I've had to draw them fairly small just to fit them in. But as that photosynthesis process is going, these things are going to get bigger and bigger and bigger and can take up a quite large, like I said, um, over 15% of the chloroplast's um, volume. Now, I do also have a video on comparing photosynthesis and cell respiration. So if you want to see kind of how photosynthesis compares to this cell respiration process, that would be another one to check out. There were also those videos on the surface area to volume ratio and on the endosymbiotic theory. Um, and so those would also be great ones to watch along with my video on the structure of mitochondria. So that is going to be it for today. Thank you very much for watching Biology Professor. And don't forget to subscribe, and I will see you next time.